Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tine Herborg Jorgensen, and I'm head of uh, the Department of Planning. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you all today to this inaugural uh, lecture by Professor Maria Patti uh, Dario. Uh, at the Department of Planning, uh, we see you as a school for us uh, in the department, and we are very happy that you have uh, accepted the position as honorable uh, professor and I uh, look very much forward to your lecture titled Challenges in Strategic Thinking for Sustainability. At the Auburn University and the Department of Planning we have a strategic focus on becoming more internationally oriented and uh, Maria uh, you are indeed part of this international orientation uh, <laughs> that we are working for and uh, you have uh, performed, uh, conducted a lot of research and, uh, all over the world and had a lot of practical experiences as well that we're looking forward uh, to learn more about and, and to collaborate uh, with you to develop uh, our research areas uh, further. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to hear that you have already met some of our researchers this week uh, besides those you knew already, among others, uh, Lone, Professor Lone Carlo, and uh, you have also had some meetings uh, uh, in, in town uh, with local stakeholders that we uh, are collaborating with, and uh, I heard that they are very thrilled to meet you, and they heard about uh, your great uh, ideas, so uh, we are really looking forward uh, to develop this uh, collaboration further together with you. The topic of the lecture, Challenges uh, in Strategic Thinking for Sustainability, is very much also in line with the core of uh, the Department of Planning's uh, activities across all our research groups. Uh, we engage in strategic developments towards sustainability within energy planning, urban planning, environmental planning, uh, various education, uh, and, and marine spatial planning, and other uh, fields. And uh, so I look very much forward for us to discuss your presentation uh, afterwards. And for all of you, um, after the lecture, uh, we would like to invite you for a glass of wine and a more informal uh, get together. Uh, so uh, I also look forward to, to meet you there. So uh, welcome. Uh, uh, let's give a big hand to Maria. Uh, yeah, and thank, you. Get started. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this is for me very, very special. Thank you for your very kind words. Um, it's very special because, um, well, uh, Alborg actually was my first destination abroad when I started my professional life many years ago. And, uh, and so it has always been somehow in my heart and I developed very good uh, friendship relations with some of your uh, eminent professors um, and so it's really a big honor to me I guess that's why I'm an honorary professor because I'm honored for very much for being for being here and being part of this family um, I, I will go through my presentation we'll try not to make it very um, long because I know that I'm in between uh, you and a glass of wine, so, and I really appreciate that, as you may realize, being from Portugal. So, uh, let's go on with this. Um, the topic is challenges in strategic thinking for sustainability. And why strategic thinking? Because uh, there's a lot going on in terms of uh, approaches to sustainability, so why talking about strategic thinking? Well, um, that's exactly what's going to be the, 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 the journey that we'll go through in this, uh, in this next uh, 45 minutes. Um, but this is, in fact, created by a range of uh, problems and a, a, a new, different views and different perspectives on what's going on in terms of the uh, most pressing environmental and social issues, as well as development issues. And, and after all, I mean, we're living through a period that is the result of our past actions and in, as well the complexity that human activities have, after all, created to ourselves. And in order to address this question, um, because I'm pretty short, 
I thought that I would, uh, before that, uh, the, what I think, first of all, what is that I understand as strategic thinking? And I, I mentioned that in my, in my brief summary, and, um, and I put it here. I want to talk about the art and craft of strategic thinking. And that is because we, the, the big challenge here is to be able to um, connect long-term vision and short-term action. And for, to do that, we not only need art, skills, uh, but also the capacity to adapt, the capacity to uh, find the, the right uh, moment and the conditions and the context within which we need to um, adjust and we need to evolve with the evolving situation. So that's what I mean by thinking strategically, but because I'm short and that's where I was before, I need to step on the shoulders of giants. And this is a group of people, uh, some of them passed away already unfortunately, some of course evidently because uh, they have been around two and a half thousand years ago, so might as well have passed away. But these are inspiring strategic minds uh, that I have been studying and that in a way have influenced a number of um, ideas and a number of uh, proposals that I've been doing over these years. And, and so I will refer to all of them as we go through, but we have people from uh, philosophy, of course, from business management, from complexity sciences, from institutional governance, from uh, planning, spatial planning, and socio-ecological um, System. So it is uh, what I think a, a quite a wide range of uh, perspectives and uh, and uh, and concepts that I've been trying to build together. And in fact, interestingly, they share a lot between themselves. Whether they come from special planning or from business management, they share. And that's the interesting part as well, because we can cross-relate different concepts. Uh, that come originally from apparently very different uh, sides and origins, and yet everybody is pointing to the same direction. So, I have four challenges uh, to present to you, and the first one is what I call here the scale up and complexity of current problems. So, everybody is familiar with the planetary boundaries, with the global environmental problems and the fact that we are facing today a number of problems which are not exactly easy to control and are not exactly uh, originated by the same source. And so this, at least these two aspects are enough to make them sufficiently complex because it's not exactly easy to resolve them. So we are in the process of having to understand what's going on, understand what may be possible ways or approaches or attitudes or practices that can um, bring uh, the planet back into a more sustainable um, practice or a sustainable uh, situation. But at the same time that we have these, uh, these, these challenges, we also have uh, results from uh, recent uh, uh, findings from this is what they call the second notice from scientists that was recently published in which we see that most of the indicators are uh, getting worse. And, and this is something that worries me uh, and I'm sure it worries everybody uh, a lot especially when we put this in the context of environmental assessment and spatial planning, for example. And the, we should ask, what, what have you been doing? What have we been doing with environmental assessment for the last 40 years? What have we been doing with planning and integrated planning for the last 40 years or 60 years? If we have evidence of uh, the, the areas of forest decreasing uh, deeply, the, the temperature raising, population raising, the species abundance decreasing. So all of these are macro uh, indicators that uh, in fact in show that the trend that the planet is following is not the one that we have to live with, that we can live with. 
but it also shows that all the policies and instruments that we have been having in place to uh, avoid these situations have probably not been working very well. And this is one of the points where I uh, raise the question, are we, being, uh, are we having the right attitude? Are we using the right instruments? Are we approaching these problems from a strategic perspective? Um, we have also other global phenomena that um, shows that we are needing to adopt different attitudes. For example, terrorism or climate change or the waste and the plastic ocean. How do we control this if we keep on using the same kind of instruments that were created in the 1960s, when things seem to be much easier than they are now in terms of uh, their complexity? At the same time, we have a different society, which is good news. We have uh, a, a society, a community that is much more aware of current problems, that is much more aware of their strengths, their power to be able to participate in these processes and to actually question science. And so this is something that is a challenge for us to be able to um, use and take the opportunity that this increasing knowledge uh, is, is creating, while at the same time we also have evidence, uh, or at least different perspectives, as to what the economy is actually leading us to. And this study from Tim Jackson is quite impressive with evidence on how economic growth no longer ensures prosperity. So that brings us also the need, the, the need to think about uh, the future development and sustainability in a different way. Now, we have been following um, basically very traditional and what some authors call the Newtonian approaches to development in which we expect that everything works in a very controllable and predictive way as if we were talking about machines. And this has been discussed by different authors, in particular Thomas Armour Dixon and Brennan Zimmerman. And in fact what happens these days is that we have to start thinking of the world in a different way. It's not possible to just think that we can control everything, that this will run like that, and that we set up a plan, where we set up a development, and it's going to happen the way we have been uh, imagining it, because it's not going to be that way. We don't have small machines operating in the world. We have small complex systems. And the complex systems cannot be described in the same way as if it was a simple mechanism. So this is one of the uh, challenges also that we have in face of us, just to change this way of thinking and the mentality associated to how we engage into development processes. Homer Dixon establishes very clearly what are the features of complex systems. They are many components in these complex systems. They have high degree of connectivity, which means that a change in one point of the system will affect the whole system altogether. They're not bounded, so the energy flows in every direction. They're not linear, and they are emergent. So this characterizes the complex systems in a way that it's totally different from the usual systematic, uh, mechanical way in which we uh, seem to have been uh, in a, you looking at the environment and the social systems altogether. Brenda Zimmerman, who, has been, uh, who developed a lot the complex adaptive system and unfortunately passed away two years ago in a car crash, uh, she addresses complexity system as a better um, alternative to be used instead of the machine me metaphor, exactly because of the emergence, self-organization, interdependencies, unpredictability, and non-linearity capacities or characteristics of complex systems. And while these people, Armour Dixon uh, and Brenda uh, Zimmerman, are looking at this uh, often from a more either business or development perspective, we can find in Patsy Healy, for example, which you, most of you in planning department, I'm sure, are familiar with, uh, and she says exactly the same thing. 
uh, strategic planning systems, she says, uh, they're not simple activities that can be easily manageable by any um, process, procedural formula. That's the way we're going to be doing planning. But in fact, they are what she calls a messy back and forth process with multiple layers of contestation and struggle. And this characterizes the decision processes that we have to work with, the planning processes. And if we are looking into the future with a long-term view, the more we have to realize and accept that systems are not linear, that the systems are complex, and that we have to find ways to work with that. Eric Barlow, which I met in Aalborg a number of years ago, has got this beautiful video that I'm not going to pass now, but you're very welcome to visit. Three minutes on how to simplify complexity. So the idea here with complexity, and that's why this is one of the biggest challenges that we have in order to face the world problems that we have today, both physical, social, economic development, sustainability as a big uh, aim that we all have, we have to face up these systems using complexity, accepting complexity, and finding ways to make it more simple. This is an inspiring video when you have the chance to look at it. Second challenge, bridging the divide between what seems to be the fragment of knowledge in terms of silo thinking as well versus the system thinking. Now a lot of people talk about system thinking but in fact then they end up uh, being very vertical in the way that they conceive the different aspects of that system. But let's look at what is that the inspiring minds telling us. Edgar Morin, a uh, French philosopher, has got this sentence which I quite like, one of the tragedies of the dominant thoughts in our society today, sorry, in our society today is that we have eminent specialists of very compartmentalized thought. I think that this, ever since I read this the first time, I thought that this was a very well put sentence of what happens in our schools, in our uh, organizations, both private and public organizations. And in fact, everybody complains about, for example, the difficulties in connecting and communicating between different departments within the same organization. That's because they are compartmentalized. That's because the silo thinking is still very much dominating, even though we have been doing a major effort for the last few years in integrating. We have. I've been part of that process. And I've been working with people that are part of that process. There's an effort. Still, it's very difficult. So, and for Edgar Morin, the compartmentalization of disciplines, in fact, impedes understanding complexity. So we have to overcome this if we want to be able to deal and to work uh, and recognize the complexity of systems. Now, there's been a number of authors stimulating the system thinking. Uh, Russell Ackoff, which uh, I believe many of you also know, has got this wonderful metaphor of the vehicle, the car, that you can have a car. Do you want to have this car? Well, yeah, but it won't move because it's just not put together. Because a system is the interaction of different parts and not just a sum of the different parts. And if these different parts are not put together in the right way, then it won't work. Um, and he has got also this very interesting, uh, what I call the wisdom theory, which relates very much to how, for example, we deal in our planning and uh, environmental assessment processes that we always try to know as much as possible, to collect as much information as possible. And many times we miss to link that information together, to put that different parts of the knowledge to interact, to discuss. Uh, even yesterday, we had a really interesting session here. And one of the conclusions from one of the eminent participants was, we need to speak more often. Exactly to interact. Exactly to enable people to learn from each other and to 
synthesize, which is another word that I will be bringing up here. And synthesize here is to collect the wisdom from all the knowledge, because we cannot work with everything, we cannot know everything, and we need to take action, short-term action for long-term view. So we need to synthesize, and we need to identify what is the wisdom that we have to use and we have to select to be able to move forward. See some thinking also coming from other sources. Uh, Donella Midos is here, maybe because she's the one with whom I first learned system thinking in a course, uh, in a training course that I had, that I had the privilege to have having with the Meadows uh, in my early days. Uh, and also the fantastic uh, Eleanor Ostrom with her institutional uh, economics approach and particularly with this model, the social ecological systems approach that she has published in science and which I find extremely inspiring because it connects the different elements but above all she centers the system in the interaction between the different elements. So it's not the different elements that matter alone but it's the interaction between them that actually make the social ecological systems working. Takes me to the challenge three and challenge three now it's opening up into the future with creative thinking so that we can lead and, and put in place this transformative process and, and move towards more sustainable practices. And to think and to talk about creative thinking, I have invited Albert Einstein. With this, uh, well, there, there would be hundreds of citations uh, that we could use from Einstein, but this one in particular is one that I have always felt uh, as very relevant and in a way, I, I remember I used this in 2002 in, or 2001 in one, when I got my first award in IAI and I had to explain why I was proposing a different methodology for strategic environmental assessment. And that was because we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we, when we created them. And if we continue using and, and practicing not only strategic environmental assessment, but also environmental impact assessment, and also planning, both spatial and sectoral planning, with the same kind of thinking that we've been using for the last 20 or 30 years, then we won't be able to find the solution for the problem. Even yesterday, we talked about that as well. So we need to stand up, go up, scale up. Uh, to other levels. I don't know which one, but we need to go to other levels so that we can find the solutions to the problems and yet be as simple as possible. And this is another um, inspiration from Einstein that I've been trying to follow a lot. Uh, when we are dealing with complex systems, the last thing we want is to be complicated. So we need to be simple without being simplistic we need to be simple. And that's the best way to try to work with complex systems. Another inspirator, Steve Jobs. And basically because of his fantastic vision and leadership capacity and creativity, which has been extremely, extremely important. It's been changing the world. And this, what he says here, that management is about persuading people to do things they do not want to do, but leadership is about inspiring people to do things they never thought they could do. I find this extremely important. And, and this happens every day. People get into their routines, they get into their comfort zone, and they think that that's what they have to do for the rest of their lives. When there's so much more that can be done, and we just need to work together and think through creatively into the future. And again, from our special planners, both from Patsy Healy and Luis Albrecht, which is a, a Belgium special planner, they also talk about strategy as transformation. So the need to make a difference. And if strategies make the difference, then they will inherently transform the systems, even though it may take time 
even though it can be slow, change is not going to be rapid. And sometimes I get a bit frightened with all the, the um, ideas and intentions and objectives and priorities put on accelerations. Accelerations may be good sometimes. It would be good now with climate change extreme events. We should accelerate the way we will be avoiding that. But that's not what we are accelerating, unfortunately. What we are accelerating many times is exactly the sources of climate change. So we're not in a safe and healthy path. For Albrecht, strategy making is explicitly transformative governance work because with this strategic work, we'll be gearing efforts to change direction, to open up new possibilities and move away from previous positions that we know that we have to improve. And in this discussion, we haven't yet, yet talked about what is strategy. Uh, so I thought that I should put here a few uh, ideas on what a strategy is from different, uh, again, from different sources. And starting with the master of strategy, of course, 2,500 years ago, Sun Tzu um, has been uh, like an inspiration and there's a, a reading book for every business management courses, as you know. Uh, but I just wanted to take from him and share with you uh, some of the learnings that for me has been very inspiring for quite some, some years. One is this fantastic idea that the general, uh, the ideal general wins the war before the fight begins. So, and that means uh, that this is about strategic thinking. This is about imagining what can happen and be ready for that. And that's what strategy is about. Strategy is not about prediction. Strategy is about imagining what we want and make the pathway to reach that. And is metaphor, is water which I also find brilliant. So strategy is like water. It should flow around obstacles and challenges. It seeks to follow the most effective path, and it responds quickly and adapts readily to change. And every time, since I read the, the, the Art of War, every time I see it's raining and I've got plants around, I look at the, the leaves of the plant and I can imagine what the drop of the water is doing up to the point that it reached this back the ocean or the river. So this is quite inspiring and this is a perfect notion of strategy. Um, Edgar Morin also um, places strategy and confronts it to program. Uh, and he says that, well, yes, we have objectives and scenarios for action within strategies, but, but Contrary to the program, which also has those objectives and scenarios, the strategy needs to modify its action as a function of the information that is accumulating and emerge uh, and, and, and consider the emerging and expected events that will be encountered in the way. And this emerging fact is something that we uh, normally, within uh, the, the normal process, with a more mechanicist uh, approach, we're not giving space for this emerging uh, fact. We're not giving space to accommodate what we are doing and quickly react like the water uh, react to obstacles that we find in the way. And, and that brings us to uh, the emerging strategy concept from Mintzberg, Henry Mintzberg, uh, in which uh, he criticizes the flow, the uh, rigid flow uh, that normally is followed, in which there's this presumption that whatever you intend to do and you decide to do, you will then implement and will work. And what he says is, well, uh, unfortunately, a lot of what is being decided will never work, and a lot that we have never thought about will emerge. And when it emerges, we'll have to be prepared to use it. We'll have to be prepared to face it. We have to be prepared to accommodate in the pathway that we're following or change the pathway to be able to cope with that. Um, and in fact, as he says, 
strategic approaches in policy and planning are not intended to find out what will happen in the future, like the crystal ball, but instead to guide our actions to meet the future we want, the, the, the desirable future, and find the right pathways to be able to do that. Now, this has been one of the um, main ideas also that has been behind the approach for strategic thinking for sustainability that I have used. Patsy Healy also talks about shaping futures and uh, finding different trajectories. And then she raises something that Minsberg also raises, the need to differentiate between analysis and synthesis. Uh, in system thinking, for Patsy Healy, there should be um, more synthesis than analysis. And for Mintzberg as well, Mintzberg says clearly planning is analysis and strategy is synthesis. And this capacity to synthesize is what we looked at before with Russell Akoff and the search for the wisdom is that capacity to synthesize. Now that is, does not come without difficulties. And in making synthesis, that need to make choices. There is a use of power in making those choices. And there are many times fears within people, planners, assessors, that should be making these choices, but sometimes they don't because they are frightened uh, that um, that they will not be able to then meet those uh, compromises that they will be wanting to uh, take. And they end up uh, sending or handing over the judgments to someone else. And this has been one of the limitations within this creative thinking and within this approach to uh, or use of strategic thinking. Now, why is this happening? And that comes, brings me to the final challenge on bridging the divide between technical rationality and strategic thinking. Uh, we learn from Bartlett and Kurian, and many of you will know this, this paper on the models in impact assessment in which they present the two models, the information processing model and the institutional model. The, the information processing model, clearly the dominant model, at least in impact assessment over the years with the concern and the belief that uh, if you collect information, if you organize information, if you deliver the information, decision can be taken. Now, the and institutional model different and more getting more strong recently as we learn more about complexity and about the needs to have different positions, uh, which relates more to how decisions are taken and how uh, different uh, institutions relate and this has been revised by recently by Alan Bond in the context and others in the context of uh, reviewing the quality in impact assessment. And one of the strong ideas that comes in this paper is the idea of pluralism. Pluralism in various perspectives. Pluralism in methods, pluralism in knowledges, pluralism in values, which is the one that I am more interested now in retaining thinking that we, in order to face sustainability with strategic thinking, a fundamental challenge is to acknowledge the different plural values that we have in the society. But the practice that we've been having with impact assessment has been, or with, and I guess some of that could be also uh, be um, attributed to planning as well, uh, has created a number of myths. It, and these myths are preventing us from changing. So let's look a bit of these. I've got identified seven myths, which I'm sure you will be very familiar with. Myth one, decisions are taken by one single central agent through an explicit and very organized and structured sequence of stages. And that will make a perfect decision. Now, this can be happening that way, but it's probably not going to take to the best decisions of all, and especially, and that's why I was emphasizing the idea of the pluralism of values, not if we want to actually acknowledge that there are a different number of values that we need to acknowledge, and there are different perspectives that we can have on a same decision. 
So this is one of the myths that is preventing us from having a more broader and more integrated approach. Myths too, we can predict everything. So the consequences of a decision can be predicted with a reasonable degree of certainty and therefore decisions on the course of action can be better done if we're based on predictions. Now, let's remember the uh, complex and, uh, and non-linear and unpredictable uh, process that we saw before with Patsy Healy. How can we predict? It will be extremely difficult. So of course, there's a number of things we can predict. The weather, the weather for the next day. Actually, we could also say that tomorrow the weather will be very similar to today with a few variations. So that's an easy prediction. There's a number of other small things that we can predict within shorter time. But let's not try to predict even one thing is scenarios. For example, with climate change, we explore the future 100 years with scenarios, but that's not prediction because we know that tomorrow it might change. And in fact, it has been changing. If you follow the, the reports of the IPCC, the, level, the sea level rise keeps on changing every time there's a report. Why should it? If it predicts well, then it should work that way. Myth three, to provide information is what you need to make better decisions. So let's put all together in big fat reports and then deliver and decision will be taken. We know so much better that many times these reports fall into the shelf and are really never influencing the decision. Myth four, the only useful legitimate knowledge is the scientific knowledge. And so the environmental analyst is committed to values of scientific-based and rationally deducted policy choices. When we know, especially now bringing again the pluralism of values, that there's so much valid knowledge out there with traditional knowledge, with community-based knowledge that live through a number of experiences and that have much to share with us in terms of scientific and improving the scientific knowledge, if we accept that. I've been in teams where just the idea of considering knowledge that comes from the community is horrendous. How can we? We are scientists, I've been told. You know, so there's so much of this attitude. Myth five, experts based science driven knowledge uh, is required and we need to take decisions based on that uh, because we'll find solutions to resolve problems. And that this, this notion of ask the expert, it's been, I've been through that, I'm sure you have as well, uh, in processes. For example, I remember now I'm in, in a municipality back in Portugal when I was trying to work with them in setting, the, setting up strategies for sustainability and all they wanted, or some of them wanted, was my report. So why do you need the report? It's not the report, you need to work with me, you need to discuss with me. We need to find together what is that we need to do and engage other stakeholders as well, which we eventually did. And it worked very well. But this notion that, no, no, you are the expert, you need to give me the report. Miss Six, uh, let's know everything because everything is important. And I, this is uh, one of the beautiful images from Eric Barlow's video about the Afghanistan war. And you know, this was presented as something that is extremely complex or complicated. And then Eric says, oh no, this is fantastic because with this kind of mind mapping, I can easily identify the beginning of the story and find a way where we need to intervene to be able to change everything else. So the idea here is this myth that we need to describe everything, we need to have uh, skills and expertise to cover everything because the more information we collect, the better. No, we need to be synthetic, we need to be selective, and we need to be systemic to be able to find what is the knowledge that we actually need to be able to extract the wisdom that we were talking about before. And myth seven, planning says what will happen in the future. So the future will happen as the plan says. Even yesterday we were talking about that. 
This expectation is still very much grounded in many people's organizations, and namely planning organizations and public policy organizations. As we know, plans are, as one of my colleagues says, plans are excellent so that they can be changed. So you, you have a plan so that you know what you can change. And that idea is still not grounded in people's minds. So these are the seven myths. And in order to illustrate uh, this difficulty before I move into the final part, I wanted to share with you an experience I had recently. Uh, I've been working in Indonesia for a few years now, but recently in October, I was there to work in one of the um, municipalities or regencies there in West Sumatra. Uh, and and to, to develop the developing a strategic environmental assessment of their uh, municipal plan and uh, because one of the challenges they have is the palm oil plantation and exploration and and they asked me for help to go there and, and try to help them in thinking through thinking into the future and finding out what is that they have to do regarding spatial planning and um, I remembered that there had been a strategic environmental assessment of the palm oil uh, plantation as part of the national midterm development plan for one sector. And they decided to use the palm oil case as this sector. So this was developed in 2010 and I went and looked into the uh, SEA. And what I found is, well, A, the target they had was perfect expansion of the palm oil plantation. Well, there's lots of money involved to a number of people, individuals and organizations and the government, national government of Indonesia. And so the idea was to uh, increase uh, 1 million hectares in 15 years, for example. Uh, not to mention the change of uh, uh, area or the, the land change that had already occurred before. And when we look at the SCA, we realize that A, this, the strategic environmental assessment for oil, palm oil development in Indonesia is only looking at palm oil. That's the first difficulty, okay? So, meaning there's no relations of palm oil with any other development sector in Indonesia. They only look at palm oil. Second, there is uh, no alternative assessment, there's no real discussion in terms of the environmental dimensions per se, if we think about you know, the existing natural forests, the existing ecological systems, the social aspects zero, except for smallholders, entrepreneurship uh, that is connected to palm oil. And the SCA basically, provides uh, 100 recommendations on how to make palm oil sustainable. And this sustainability is seen in terms of increased productivity, in terms of partnerships between private owners and uh, national government and smallholders that will contribute to the system, in terms of the use of abundant land, in terms of mitigation, all about palm oil. And then I found two references to natural forests. One is a moratorium on palm oil development on natural forests and peat, because the peat is another issue, because with land change, the peat land is taken away as well. And the need to only allow plantations in abandoned land and not on natural forests, which I found unique, especially when we look at what has been happening. And we have these two maps that I was given in Dharmas Raya, one from 1985 with the occupation of natural forest, native forest, this other forest, and what is the situation now in 2016, with a lot of areas already being cleared so that, of course, the plantation can, can happen. So you wonder, how come this happened? And then we look into what's happening. Uh, here we have uh, still some remaining uh, native forest with rivers which show the increasing sedimentation that has been happening because of all the erosion that results from the deforestation. 
massive deforestation has been happening in that place to be replaced by uh, palm oil plantations and rubber plantations, the dominant plantations there. Now, of course, there will be a lot of uh, share smallholders that will benefit from this situation, government of Indonesia, national level as well. Uh, but A, Indonesia is not doing very well with respect to emissions of green gas emissions because 4% is coming from the deforestation in Indonesia, according to the National Geographic. And what we see there today, socially speaking, and environmentally, economically, is this. We have one road, basically, across that area that is packed this way, as you can see. This is from October 2017, my photo. I was there. I took two hours to do 60 kilometers because it was just not possible to move. There's too many tra trucks carrying palm oil and rubber. Uh, there is, of course, still some other activities, soil, uh, rice, sorry, rice plantation taking place. But what we see here in terms of the villages is not exactly what you could call a sustainable well-being for the community. Now, this is seven years at least after the SCA. We can ask, what was the role of the SCA? Why is that the SCA did not look into other possible development opportunities that could establish synergies with palm oil, if palm oil is ine inevitable. And is that normal, that we keep on uh, knocking down forests at the rate that they have? What are the ecological consequences of that? Because of that concern, WWF commissioned this study, and they are worried, namely, about this small portion of red that you can see in this map. And this small portion of red is still the remaining of a native forest that is already compromised. And this is part of what they call the Rimba Corridor, which is a major final Russell's effort of WWF to maintain the ecological integrity of that forest and ensure the viability of the tiger, the elephant, the um, uh, other species. And that's why we are working, or we were working, with the community, with the planner, the head of the environmental division, a number of other stakeholders from other departments in the, the Regency to find forms of looking strategically into the future of Dharma Nostraya so that they can decide what they want from the future. Both from a cultural perspective, in terms of what their culture needs so that they can continue, but also in terms of other business opportunities that can be complementary to the palm oil, but which also need land. So this is an, a story that I find quite illustrative of the difficulties that we have in engaging into strategic thinking. We're trying to make that effort now, but so far, this has not been really strategic, I would say. It's not an easy process uh, or an easy enterprise. And like Patsy Healy says, uh, it involves scientific analysis, design science, but also a lot of sensibility, which does not exist in one or another. And from Minsburg, we get this notion of the molding process, the need to adapt, the need to respond. OK, we don't have that forest in Indonesia anymore. But what is that we can do now? We don't need to continue the same process and the same rate of destruction that has been happening so far. So how can we improve the strategic thinking? Well, we need to acknowledge complexity and system thinking. And we need to go from this traditional linear form of thinking into a more systemic acknowledging complexity. We need to avoid rigid procedures. And in doing this, that means, for example, that if we want to dance tango, we have to choose the right partner because this partner might not be the right one because it's too rigid. No uh, standard moves and zero emotion. 
lone corner of blue cell is what, all about that. We need to improve flexibility and adaptation so that we find creatively new forms of responding to existing challenges. We need to focus on root causes, and this comes from uh, the, the, the problem tree uh, that in which we need to focus here, down here, into the root causes of problems, and always ask the question, why? Why doing it? We need to risk out of comfort zone and not be a afraid of change, which is one of the big reasons why things do not change, because people are afraid of changing. So in order to do this transition to successful strategic thinking, we need to go from reactive integration to proactive integration, from, from check and control to more coordination and collaboration, in which the decision makers are the ones sitting in the driving seat. They need to be the ones doing that because that's the only way that it's going to be, get integrated into their minds, their preferences, their priorities. We need to go from problem solving to creating motivations, like in the lines of Steve Jobs, leadership towards you know, telling people that they can do even though they think they could not do. And we need to go from delivering information to help creating the future which is something that we should not be afraid of doing because if we think, and even yesterday we were talking about that as well, if we are revising our decisions every two years, it's no fear. We can think about what we want in the future, take the decision today, and in the next two years, if it didn't work, we will change. We will revisit. That is happening in a number of sectors. For example, in uh, transmission lines, in electricity transmission grids. They, every two years, they revisit the projects that they're going to develop. So it's possible. It's only a question of reframing the way that we're working these days. So I have tried to have a help for that in the work that I've been doing for the last 10 years with the Framework for Strategic Thinking for Sustainability which I have developed, in fact, in the context of strategic environmental assessment, but which can be used. You know, this, this, this idea, this notion of uh, not only positioning the instrument in relation to the decision process, in relation to what is happening uh, in terms of various uh, processes, but also in molding, in adapting to what is needed. The idea with the framework for strategic thinking for sustainability is to help create context for sustainable development. So what is that we want with sustainable development? And what, is, what are the conditions that need to be in place for that? This methodology has got three key features. The first is the strategic focus, in which I have developed the concept of critical decision factors as selective and systemic strategic pointers in the nerve systems, something that helps to prioritize strategically thinking, looking into the long term but acting in the short term. What are the themes that we need to concentrate on and that can make a difference? Thinking about pathways and finding pathways for sustainability, exploring them, but exploring them together, collectively thinking with others that will be part of that process. Because the, the pathways are not only depending on the planet, they depend on all the actors that are out there actually implementing plans or implementing development, which then will fit within the plan or not. And then the plan needs to adjust to reality and needs to drive reality. And continuing dialogues, that's an essence. The continuing dialogues, it's something that is absolutely essential not only between people, but between processes. Uh, and it needs to be continually. We need to be revisiting all the time what we are doing. So this calls for a different concept from what has been uh, used so far in terms of environmental assessment. This is the simple uh, expression of this methodology with three main stages. One uh, that uh, is the focus stage, the first stage which is exactly to prioritize 
broad Indian integrated uh, aspects that will contribute to creating those sustainable futures that we aim to uh, move forward and to help the transition process to happen. With the critical decision factors, there are those pointers that help us to have something. It's like an anchor that we, ha we can grab to so that we can follow up that process. And this first part, this first stage is so important that I would recommend that you dedicate 60%, at least or 65% of the effort of any strategic assessment to set that um, focus right, to set that process right. How are we going to do it? And agree with different uh, views, with different values in presence. Then, when we have that right, we can then explore. Assess by exploring. Exploring what can be different pathways. Start with one, assess, look at it. See what are risks and opportunities. And then try to resolve the risks, maintaining the opportunities. Don't lose the opportunities. Try to adjust and evolve together. And then a third stage, which is the one I call the continual stage, to ensure links between processes, between different stakeholders, different views, different values, and to learn. Follow up for learning, not to pile up reports of monitoring, to learn. And this is what I call the continuous dialogues to uh, use in a cyclic form together with the planning process that should also be cyclical as well. Uh, just the concept of the mapping of the critical factors that needs to be very much linked to vision, long-term vision, short-term action, and then help to prioritize what can be success factors that can make a difference, can make a transformation. This can also engage uh, the our sustainable development goals, which is nowadays a major goal for everybody. Now, this methodology has got one element here, which is what I call the strategic reference framework. And this strategic reference framework is to bring together macro policies as big drivers for the future, together with environment and sustainability concerns and the, strate the development strategic issues. So by bringing with this strategic reference framework, we're able to bring in the sustainable development goals and ask the question, which of them are relevant? How can this planning process, this development process, contribute to these sustainable development goals? And also, as it was discussed yesterday, even though I didn't include, what are the sustainable development goals that eventually we may be affecting? And we don't want that because we, we need to make them happen. We don't have time anymore. This is what we need to accelerate. So, in synthesis, the challenges in strategic thinking for sustainability, first, imagine the future you want. You, we want, collectively, to enable opportunities. And to do this, we need to act now to reach the future, keeping view of the long term. We need to be selective, systemic, and focused on what matters. We cannot work with everything, so we need to choose. Making choices is difficult. We saw what Albrecht said, but we need to do them, and we cannot be afraid of doing them. If we do them together, collectively, it's not so difficult. It's more easy, because then we share. We need to put emphasis on values, not on problems. We need to be constructive. We keep on having to deal with problems and finding solutions to problems. My students in environment engineering in the university in Portugal, whenever I try to get them to look at the problem, they come immediately with a solution. They don't even know what the problem is. How can they know the solution? So if we think about values, what is that we want to promote? then that will probably start changing the mindset. We need to change, adapt, be flexible, and learn so that we create resilience. We need to stimulate this creative learning and collaboration through dialogues. And we need to build trust, collective intelligence, and embrace the pluralism of values. And 
thinking outside the box, be strategic, and change minds. Tuck for. <laughs> Thank you. I keep that on. Is it on? No. No. So, thank you so much, Maria, for a very inspiring, a bit provocative, I guess, for some of us sitting here. I guess. Um, also, a welcome or a good afternoon to this prestigious event, I would say. Um, for, for those of you who don't know me, I am Mumu Colonel and I'm head of the Danish Center for Environmental Assessment where we've been honored to have Maria as our honorary professor for the next five years. And it's really also gratifying to having the diversity of participants today for your lecture. And we have colleagues from the center, we have from other research groups, we have from new students, and we also have from outside the university. We have some of you from consultancies and local authorities. We are working with you in different ways, and this is also a nice way for us in the center to link more to practice and continue the work here in the Danish context on this on strategic thinking. We have now heard a critical but also very inspiring lecture on strategic thinking, and I think you have illustrated very well the need but also the opportunities for advancing our existing approaches on environmental assessment uh, towards a more strategic integration of sustainability in decision making. I'm sure it has stimulated some thoughts, some questions, maybe some internal debate that we would like to bring to the open uh, and possibly also some, some thoughts for the future. So I will now welcome comments, ideas, questions, and comment uh, and, and a dialogue with Maria concerning this. So the floor is open to you and having this chance. Yes?